Okay, thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Martin Lee. I'm the technical lead of security research at TALUS, which is the threat intelligence and security research arm of, uh, of Cisco. And I had the great pleasure of working here in Belfast in the last year for Alert Logic, so it's lovely to see so many friendly faces who I know in the audience and to be back in Belfast again, which is great. What I want to talk to you about today really comes from a, uh, a, a project of reflection. Um, I spent quite a long time working in security research and analyzing malware and looking for attacks. And sort of, as you do on a, on a flight or on a long journey, start thinking. And start thinking, well, if I move to the bad side, and I actually started writing my own malware and conducting my own attacks, Knowing what I do about detecting attacks, what would I actually do? And how would I go about uh, attacking systems and trying to find interesting things? And I think this is actually a really, really good point if we are defenders and we're defending networks and hunting for attackers. It's often a good time to start thinking, knowing what I know about this system, what would I do? How would I attack it? And if I was going to attack it, how would I, as a defender, actually know that and be able to pick it up? So, the biggest thing that I really started thinking about was, yeah, using DNS lookups maliciously. And then, how would I, how would I know, how would I detect them, are actually bad guys using this at the moment? So, Lockheed Martin have put together this cyber kill chain supposedly to describe attacks, which got all these long and sexy words uh, in their weaponization and command and control, action on objectives, wonderful military style language. Um, for me, my own personal cyber kill chain, um, really I, I, I wouldn't bother too much about weaponization or command and control. For me, if I was an attacking a system, it would be about getting inside it in some way. Uh, much the same as Johnny, Johnny I'm a, a great magpie for data, so if I was getting inside a system, yeah, I'd probably look for some sort of interesting data of some sort that I could get my hands uh, a hold of, and then I'd have to get that data back to me. I'd need to exfiltrate it in some, in some way. So first, let's think about this kill chain and think how we'd actually get inside an organisation. If it was me, very, very simply, I would send someone an email. This is a, a, an actual attack. This is distributing uh, Rosetto ransomware. For me, in my own personal experience, I think the far easiest way of getting inside an organization is writing a very nice letter to someone, uh, please click this link. You would be amazed at the number of people that will just open that without any thought, even if you Give the training and you teach people within the organization and you say, don't click the link on unexpected emails and they'll do the training and they'll go away saying, yeah, 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 don't, don't click the link on uh, unexpected emails. If you were to send them an unexpected email afterwards, there would still be a subset of the people that would still click it. And you'd say, well, why did you click that? They'd say, well, because it, it was interesting. So there's a subset of users in any organization that are resistant to that message, don't click the link. Someone will always do it. Um, interestingly, these people from a, def a defender's point of view are actually gold dust because they are your canaries on the network. So actually, these individuals in your own systems, when you find them, they're the ones that are going to have the interesting malware on their systems. Um, so, you know, you might want to make it more difficult for them to be able to access uh, your particularly interesting systems, but they're actually really, really good to monitor. Interestingly, um, in our own organization, Cisco, our security office has a continuous program of sending uh, attack emails such as these fake ones that are generated inside uh, to members uh, within Cisco. Um, just trying to see how effective this message is of, uh, of, of people getting through on don't click the link. Our um, CISO is very, very proud to say that the response rates, in inverted commas, to his attacks 
range from 10% in sales and marketing down to just 1% within the security business, which is great. I mean, it shows that security people are, are, are good at picking up these kind of attacks. And I have to put my hand up and say I was one of the 1% that fell for one of his attack emails. But in my defense, it wasn't an unexpected email. I expected it. Three days before this attack email came through, I, I had a question, something boring about uh, uh, the accountancy for claiming back expenses that I sent to HR. So I'd logged an HR ticket. Can you give me information about, can, actually, I wanted to claim back uh, the cost of my home broadband from my employer. I wanted to ask, can I do that? Uh, is it possible? Uh, so I got back a, an email from HR saying, yeah, we'll look into it. Three days later, I receive an email from someone who I'd never heard of before with an attachment saying, here is your financial information you requested. Brilliant! I was expecting this email. It was exactly what I expected. So I clicked on the email, I opened up the attachment, and it said, you, Martin Lee, have opened an unauthorized attachment. Frankly, you should know better. Um, but it wasn't an unexpected email. I was expecting it. So if you were to send enough emails such as this, here are the documents you were, you, you were expecting, somebody would be expecting a document and would open it. And if you send enough of these to a, a larger enough organization, enough recipients, you will most definitely get through, no matter what. Um, we also spend, in the industry, a lot of time thinking about vulnerabilities and gentlemen next door talking about Internet of Things, vulner vulnerabilities, there is a lot of vulnerabilities out there. Writing software is difficult, and if there's a bug in the software, there will be something which we can uh, exploit, something we can use to get inside the organization. The good news is that actually these low-hanging fruit, these vulnerabilities that are very, very easy to exploit, there's actually less and less vulnerabilities like this that are being discovered. The bad news, yeah, we're still looking at about 30% of all vulnerabilities are network accessible, low complexity, and require little in the way of authentication. But, I would go back, if I'm an attacker, frankly, I'm going to go through the uh, easiest way in, and to be honest, I'm really, really unlikely to spend time writing some sort of complicated exploit to uh, uh, try and trigger one of these vulnerabilities. Personally, I would just send the email. Nevertheless, there are an awful lot of these easy to exploit vulnerabilities that are out there. This has not escaped the attention of the bad guys. So earlier this year, there was a gang uh, distributing SamSam ransomware. Um, who were actually exploiting a single vulnerability. Their attack kit was only one exploit. They were exploiting uh, a six-year-old vulnerability in JBoss, which is a Java server uh, piece of software. Um, we identified, or well, when we found that this gang was exploiting this one vulnerability, and we scanned the internet, we actually found 3.2 million systems that were running this six-year-old vulnerability unpatched on the internet. Very, very, very large attack service if you wanted to exploit that. Within those 3.2 million at-risk servers that we identified that were wide open to the internet, 2,100 had actually already been compromised. They already had a web shell uploaded to them. But actually, the attackers just haven't got round to uh, taking over the machine and installing the ransomware. They had too many computers that were vulnerable that they'd exploited to actually keep up with the mechanism of installing the, mal mal the malware, the ransomware, encrypting the system, and demanding the payment. There's more work for them than they can actually manage it. So, if I'm an attacker, to be honest, I don't think I'm going to have that much difficulty getting inside an organization. More than likely, I'd send an email. If I wasn't going to send an email, I'd look for a relatively old vulnerability, easy to exploit, and just get it to get straight in. Once I'm in there, okay, I want to find some uh, interesting information. Do we think that's difficult? 
I think realistically, all we have to do is look at the news headlines, and we find lots and lots of documents, interesting information which is being leaked, which is being lost by attackers after they get inside the, uh, the organization. So I don't think finding interesting data is going to be particularly difficult for me. What might be slightly more difficult is actually getting that information back to me. Now, if you're an attacker, you've got really an unlimited number of ways that you could get that information back to you. Once you've compromised the system and you're on it, you then want to get that information back to you. And say we've got our um, evil domain malicious.com where we're sitting, we're hoping to get that data exfiltrated. We could use any of the normal uh, mechanisms of data transport over the internet. We could FTP it. We could log in over SSH or use SFTP and transfer the data. We could even put it in some sort of web request or something, or even you know, maybe post it to uh, Facebook and get it back that way over the web. Lots and lots of different ways that we can do this, but if our sysadmins are doing their job correctly, then I would really, really hope that they put in place some kind of firewall rule. So if I've managed to get inside and compromise a server where there's interesting information being held, if the sysadmin and the network manager is really doing their job, I would like to think they've got some kind of firewall rules in place. That this machine, because it's a server, because it holds sensitive data, you can't just FTP it out anywhere. Or you can't send it over whatever protocol. You have to go in through a different system or be authenticated or something. Or even without the, the firewall rules to block that particular means of transport, they can put in IP block lists. Um, if my malicious domain is causing enough noise on the internet and it's being seen often enough, sooner or later it's going to get itself blacklisted. And again, if my network admin, if my systems administrator is doing their job, I'd really like to think that they're going to deploy some form of IP block list to at least block connections with the, the worst offenders of, uh, of having malicious um, uh, communication with them. So, if I'm a bad guy, and I'm thinking, okay, I want to get inside this system, I want to get the data back to me, there's a possibility or probability that this is going to be blocked by a firewall. Um, I've also got the possibility, at the very least, I'm going to leave traces in the gateway logs that someone could go back and identify me and block my IP address, which would spoil all my fun. If, hypothetically, can we think of a mechanism that I could actually use to steal data in such a way that it wouldn't be blocked by IP addresses and it wouldn't be blocked or be unlikely to be blocked by firewall rules. Um, and also that would be quite difficult for someone to track in the logs. Hmm. The clue is in the title of the talk. The hint. So let's think about DNS. So just about every machine is going to do some form of DNS request at some time. It's very unlikely that we're going to block DNS messages as, uh, uh, on our firewall to stop a machine doing DNS lookups. It would mean that it wouldn't be able to do much of the work of any kind of machine. So in a normal application, a DNS request, we've got a machine which is asking for, well, what is the IP address of example.com? goes to the local DNS server, um, it's either going to be cached or not. If it's not cached, then that local DNS server will go to a higher level uh, um, uh, name servers, DNS servers. It's going to come back and says, well, you know, well, I don't actually know what www.example.is, but I can give you the name server for example.com. You can ask them, they will know the answer, and they will come back with a reply. So this is how DNS works. We use it all the time. It's going on everywhere, all the time. How can we use this to steal data? Well, very, very simply, we can use subdomains. So our compromised host, we ask it to do its DNS lookup. 
But instead of asking, you know, what is the address of www.malicious.com, we'll include our secret data as a subdomain. We say, I want to know the address of topsecretdata.malicious.com. Goes to our local DNS server, our local DNS server hasn't got a clue, goes through the system, we get to the name server of our malicious domain, and that says, yeah, 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 I know the answer for that, it's what, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter, uh, we'll just send back anything. But that request is now in the logs of our malicious name server. So us with our malicious hat on, we can then go through the log, kick out these subdomains which are being asked, and we can use that to reassemble the information that we're looking to exfiltrate. Fiendish, right? You're always going to allow DNS lookups. Uh, you're hardly likely going to be blocking uh, your compromised system or your server where your top secret information is talking to your local DNS server. Of course not. And are you really going to have loads of IP block lists for your local DNS server about what other DNS servers it talks to? Probably not, to be honest. So we've got a viable mechanism for stealing information. But there's still a couple more steps. We've got, we've got problems with punctuation. If this data that we're stealing is anything other than like seven bit ASCII, uh, it's not gonna fit inside our, uh, our subdomain encoding of this data. If it's got punctuation, it's not gonna work. If it's got a space, it's not gonna work. Um, so we, uh, and also we've got the problem of, of maintaining case. Uh, the DNS lookups, quite easily, the case could be all forced into uppercase and then lowercase, and we'd lose that information. So we need some way of encoding our top secret data. Um, normally, if we're going to encode data, or very frequently, we'd use Base64. The problem with Base64 is we'll sometimes use a, um, a plus in the encoding, which we can't have in a DNS lookup, but we can use its cousin, Base32 encoding, which very simply changes everything. So it changes our top secret data into this kind of gobbledygook of uh, encoded text. It will deal with punctuation, it will deal with spaces, it will deal with capitalization. Even if our Base32 encoded string gets changed into lowercase, well, we can easily change it back again into uppercase, and we won't lose any information. So for exfiltrating data, absolutely wonderful. So our DNS requests that we might see in our logs would be something along the lines of, well, we're going to be lots of www dot as a subdomain. There's going to be lots of mail dot or db or name server or server something or other in our DNS requests. And there's also going to be this long string of base32 encoded data. So already, we can look at that and think, if I wanted to discover people who were exfiltrating data using this mechanisms in our logs, what am I going to do? Sure, I'll ask you the question. Audience participation. <laughs> how how could I how could I distinguish these uh, these requests? Uh, how to write a script? You look for the type of data. Exactly. We're going to look for that type of data. How can we distinguish this type of uh, of subdomain? Actually, actually, it's a very good point. We could we could try doing that reverse uh, lookup to see if it worked, which is a very good way. Anyone else? A far simpler way of identifying it, looking at the types of DNS requests and subdomains that we'd expect. Yeah, How, entropy in the string. Entropy, excellent one. Size. Very, very simply, we'll just look for long subdomains. Easy, right? Because if we want to exfiltrate all that data, base32 encoding actually makes it longer. We'll just look for long <coughs> subdomains in our DNS data, right? Easy. So, one other thing about working at Cisco, we've got enormous amounts of telemetry to go looking in. Uh, one of which is the open DNS uh, system. Where, which is a managed DNS system, so lots and lots of people put DNS requests through the system and we uh, analyze these and block malicious domains. Brilliant, let's go looking in this data. Wonderful, we've got 80 billion lookups per day. Right, um, if I'm looking for long subdomains, 
wonderful. <coughs> I've got 100 million of them. Um, this is far, far more data than I can actually cope with. There's no way I'm going to wade through this by hand, looking for which of these long subdomains. Um, if you do this exercise, you will find that there are some people who really, really like long subdomains. Um, and we'll find them all over the place. And distinguishing those for the ones which are malicious, yeah, to be honest, we're not going to do this by hand. We need to find another way of doing this. So, what are we looking for? We're looking for something anomalous, something which is unusual, an unusual trace within the data. So to spot what is unusual, what we need to do is identify what's normal. So let's work with our data and model the distribution of subdomain lengths in DNS lookups. So that's the curve in orange, and we see we've got loads and loads of lookups of length 3, which is www, and then that curves off way, 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 way onto the right, and as the subdomains get longer, they actually get less and less frequent. And if we look at this data, it looks very, very much like an exponential decay. It's an exponential decay curve, which is great, because we understand exponential decay curves. We understand how to express them. We can have a mathematical equation for this, e to the minus lambda x, where x is subdomain length. So we can construct an ideal curve of what the data should look like. What should it be normally? And then, we can just go through and compare the reality that we see with our ideal perfect fit curve to this. And if we do this, we find something very, very interesting. Basically, all we do is divide the number of occurrences of the subdomain length that we expected, divided by, sorry, the frequency of the observed subdomain length, and we divide it by the expected value and see what we get. So in a perfect world, that should be about 1. Uh, it should be equal to what we expect. WWW, way over the left-hand side, we saw it in the original curve. We've got this massive spike. When we divide our expected value by what we see together, well, do you know what? It doesn't even break. It's a, you know, it's a couple of times longer, but not by that much. However, as we come further out into the longer, longer subdomains, we start seeing these enormous spikes. So there's something happening here which is really, really unusual. We're finding subdomains of this really long length that are occurring in much, much higher frequencies than we'd expect according to our model of the data. So instead of looking at 100 million uh, DNS entries and trying to identify things by hand, really, all we have to do is identify these lookups of this particular length. These are our anomalies. This is where the bad stuff is happening. Let's have a look and find and see what we find. And I was actually really surprised and, uh, and really quite happy um, to find very, very quickly active exfiltration by malware. Uh, Multigrain is a, a point-of-sale malware and it exfiltrates credit card details in exactly the same way that I've described. Takes the credit card number and the PIN, Base32 encodes it, puts it in a DNS lookup, does the DNS lookup, the bad guy is owning the name server at the end, collecting the logs, doing the reverse and finding the credit cards. Um, absolutely fiendish way of doing it, exactly the same way that I'd go about doing it. Here it is, we see it happening in the wild. Um, I found this whole pattern of, um, of lookups that, that really I didn't quite understand what was happening. Um, what I could see is that they were very, very closely related. We've got this pattern, um, either LL, uh, three, three identical letters of so LL, so OOO, or log. And then we've got this string NU, NU6T, which was conserved, and a whole load of random stuff, um, but a number of dots in there to, um, uh, to separate it out. One of the domains, so dojfgj.com, was a known domain used by Multigrain. The other two domains, amook.com and beavish.com, were, were previously uh, unknown, but we could see these were following exactly the same pattern, and this was 
exactly what we were looking for, exfiltration over DNS, wonderful, we block the further malicious domains, protect people using, using open DNS. The malware itself, it cuts its information up into different chunks. The first subdomain is a machine identifier, and then the next bit in the middle, which I've cut out in case someone actually works out what the uh, encryption is, they take the credit card details, encrypted it, base32 encoded it, and exfiltrated it over DNS. Wonderful, evil stuff, absolutely superb. Um, once we've got those domains, we can then go back to our data and see what else is happening. And we find further traces with these same malicious domains. So there's two patterns. We've got a very, very long lookup, which is exfiltrating the credit card data. And then we've got these short lookups that we see quite a few of. <coughs> to be honest, I've no idea what these are. My guess is this is the malware just pinging home and saying, hi, I'm alive, but I've got nothing new to report would be my guess. So, so fortified and encouraged by my success in looking at um, uh, multigrain, then went through further as looking at other pieces of uh, suspiciously long lookups that I could identify from these anomalies. Came across this other domain, 29a.de, and again, after much searching, I actually find that someone had identified that that was uh, another point of sale system that was exfiltrating credit card data, actually using a much simpler system. It's just a, a, an XOR key against the credit card details, again, used as a, uh, as a subdomain. So again, we were able to identify this, see this within the data, and just block the domain. And, and wonderful, we've made the world a better place. People are protected. So as I was writing this presentation, um, something happened um, that hit the news that I thought, yes, this is exactly what I'm looking for, this is exactly what I'm interested in. However, it's far, far more complicated and, and maybe far, far more interesting, but there's no neat ending to it. Um, a few weeks ago, Kaspersky discovered the Sauron APT Trojan. So this is a, a, a sophisticated piece of malware that they'd identified and Wonderfully for me, within the write-up, we find that it's got a DNS exfiltration tool called Dext. Brilliant. I know about DNS exfiltration. I know about how to find it. We can now add to the sale of the story. Also, from the code that they've published, we've got these snippets of code found within the, uh, the Trojan. Doing base32 encryption. Brilliant, we know about the base32 encryption, we know exactly what this looks like. We've got the pattern that we can search for. Even better, they'd identified the domain that the bad guys were using, bikesall.com. So, although we don't know what many of these components actually do, we can start making some good guesses. There's something to do with DNS exfiltration, it's almost certainly going to be via a lookup. We also know that it involves base32 encryption. Brilliant, we know what that looks like. And we also know the domain that they've been using. So this is gonna be really, really easy, right? Um, let's look in our data. Let's try and identify something a bit more about this domain. It's actually owned by what looks like, and what I have no reason to doubt, is a legitimate reseller of domains. So I was expecting to find the name server under the control of a malicious entity or held on a, some sort of secret network somewhere. No, they're using a domain reseller. Okay, why not? It's kind of interesting. Um, this particular domain, bikesport.com, was on, these had these two name servers, domain name available.com, and there were 600 other domains that were also had shared the same name servers. So potentially, they might just have chosen bikesport.com for this one attack and perhaps picked one of the other domains that was being offered by this domain server for the rest of their attack. Also, domain name available.com, its name server was namebrightdns.com and these four name servers shared the same IP space. They were obviously very, very close together. So I thought, well, okay, let's just look and we'll do the same 
experiment that we did looking for the lengths of the DNS for these four servers and see what we can find. Let's look at the lengths of the subdomains that are being used. Um, interestingly, we found no trace whatsoever of bikesport.com in our telemetry. Uh, nothing. So, suggesting perhaps the bad guys were actually had been very careful to cover their tracks so that they weren't leaving traces in the telemetry that we had available to us. But they weren't that careful because we found this wonderful peak of lengths of subdomains, 10 characters long. Far, far more of these 10 character long lookups than we'd expect. So I thought, absolutely wonderful, here we are, end of the story, they're doing their exfiltration by 10 character length subdomain lookups. So let's look at some of these lookups. So we've got sort of a few types of, uh, of words in there that we might expect for a DNS lookup. We've got timesheets, we've got wallpapers, sales admin, lesbians, exactly the type of subdomains that you'd expect will be used on the internet. And then we've got this random stuff, which obviously is very, very random indeed. Interestingly, it's not going to that domain that I expected it to. It's actually going to the name server of the name server of the domain which has been found in the malware. Kind of interesting. Also, it's only 10 characters long. I would have expected something much, much more longer. So perhaps there's more going on here. Maybe their tools are cutting up these long strings into 10 character lengths and repeatedly doing it to hide their traces. Maybe not, maybe it's something else. When I started looking in more detail, it sort of started making me think, well, actually, maybe this could be a denial of service attack. And maybe we're seeing someone put through, much the same as Johnny's requests, uh, random requests to a name server to try and overwhelm it. Um, but when we look at the time distribution of it and try to recreate that from the, uh, uh, the data that we have, we're only seeing at a maximum five packets, five requests per second, which is much, much less than I'd expect for a denial of service attack. And many times we're only seeing one or two. Also, if this is a denial of service attack, it's been going on for an awfully, awfully long time. Uh, far, far longer than I expect for a denial of service attack. And also, the time between each one of these bursts of packets on average is 25 hours. So this really, really doesn't look to me as if it's a denial of service attack. Other thing that we had, there's a, a, a bug within Chrome which um, adds uh, occasionally random characters to a lookup. So we thought, well, yeah, you know, maybe this could be a bug somewhere, some kind of artifact. Um, if so, well, we probably find it everywhere, uh, not only in this one particular uh, uh, DNS infrastructure. And when I went to try and find the, the five largest posters of, uh, of DNS systems on the internet, including Office 365 and a load of others, we got a massive peak of three, but to be honest, nothing at, at length of 10. There was a slight over-representation. It appeared to be one domain that was maybe being used for testing, but there was nothing, nothing significant. We just thought, great, okay, we've got this one name server, we know that it's been used in attack, we know that it's got this over-sampling uh, of 10 length strings that we find nowhere else. If I keep looking for other name servers, I'm not going to find this pattern, which means it's specific to that. Oh, okay. Um, when I got to another domain reseller, I found exactly the same pattern. Um, so there's something going on here. And if we look at what these subdomains of length 10 was, yeah, very, very similar indeed. Um, again, the name server of this domain reseller, these same 10 character length subdomains, um, and also this set of domain mains, so mains.eu, mains.net, names.de, names.at, which obviously had been subjected to the same kind of activity. Again, we can ask ourselves, is this a denial of service attack? No, uh, remarkably similar pattern to the last one. 
um, one, three, five packets per second, going on for a very, very long time. Average length within, between uh, packets in, uh, in this one, I think it was 11 hours rather than 25. It might be a DNS exfiltration. It might not. It's almost certainly not a denial of, of service attack, but it's kind of difficult to work out exactly what's going on here. So I kind of got this down to a couple of possibilities. Um, this definitely isn't as simple as a bad guy having a malicious name server and sending the information direct to that. Um, the name servers in this case, as far as I can tell, are legitimate organizations that are selling domains. So it's not that. It looks like a bad guy sending requests over to a legitimate name server that's been compromised. Potentially, a bad guy has actually compromised this and has got a fish to username or a password. Why not? We've got access to the DNS logs. One of the domain uh, name hosters had an API which allowed you to have some access to DNS information. Potentially, there's the possibility that that API, that the attacker might have been able to compromise the API in some way and get access to the raw logs. I have no idea. Another possibility <coughs> is that our attacker is actually using the same, tele same type of telemetry that we are. And they're actually somehow sniffing the lookups that are going to the legitimate name server and just doing that intercept and holding that information and recreating it. The other thing which I cannot discount, which is incredibly, incredibly frustrating, this might just be someone's testing tool. And there's some kind of tool which is being used in the DNS hosting environment to test uh, name servers and to measure their response rates that I don't know about. In fact, what we're seeing that we're thinking might be exfiltration, might just be an artifact of somebody's testing regime. It's kind of frustrating, but I can't distinguish between those. But it makes quite a good example of how sometimes when you think you're looking for something, um, you don't actually find it. You find something that kind of looks like it, but you need to keep your mind open to the possibility that what you're seeing isn't necessarily what you expect to see. So to try and bring this up into some sort of conclusion, um, if you're only going to remember one thing, please remember that DNS lookups are a viable exfiltration mechanism. We can use this as a mean to steal data, and bad guys are actively doing this at the moment. So if you're defending systems, Think about monitoring your DNS traffic and look at the things which are unusual. Um, another thing to keep in mind, if you are hunting for DNS exfiltration, consider other options. What you see might not be necessarily what it is that you're looking for. And to remember to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you're chasing DNS exfiltration lookups and you find suspicious traces in your data, there may well be other explanations. It's not necessarily a DNS lookup. In terms of advice and what you can actually do about this, I, I think maybe it's about asking yourself a few questions. One, the first place that you want to look up is your DNS logs. Where are they going to be housed? On your local DNS server somewhere. First question I'll ask you, well, how many do you have? And then the next question is, well, why do you need so many? Um, almost certainly you will have far, far more DNS servers or servers acting as DNS servers on the network than really you need, which makes monitoring logs that little bit more difficult. Once you've got those logs together, I think the next thing is really to ask the question, well, what system made the most DNS lookups last week? And then to understand why. Why was this system making so many DNS, doing their DNS lookups? There might be a very, very good answer for it. It might simply be because it's doing reverse DNS, it's the web server, it's doing reverse DNS lookups for its logs, or something like that. But you know, make sure you're aware of why is this is the case. And then, as you build up those answers, you can go down and start looking, well, has anything changed from this week to last week? Is there something different? And again, if you're seeing something different, start asking the question, well, what's going on here? Other thing, hey, Consider a managed DNS system. Um, 
consider doing things externally, maybe using something such as OpenDNS so that you've got a team of researchers who are doing this searching for you rather than, rather than you relying on doing it yourself. Definitely, definitely, as a good practice, with whatever systems you're looking after, I would encourage people to start thinking, well, how would I actually attack this? What would I do? How would I break into my system? And if I was going to do this, how would I know? What would it actually look like in the logs? What, would, what should I look for to detect whether someone's attacking my system as using the techniques that I would use as an expert in knowing the system and knowing how it's protected? And then also, once you've got data, yeah, model it. Try and <coughs> come up with some sort of way to model the data so that you can identify normal from abnormal. And when you find those things which are abnormal, go and investigate it. And often it's actually really, really easy. Um, you will find the modeling stuff to exponential plots as a function in Excel. Uh, basically, all you need is uh, Excel, create the graph, look at what you can be measured, uh, maybe look at lengths of things, rates of changes, changes of things, look what kind of graph it looks like, get Excel to model it, and then you can divide your perfect line by your observed line and look for the, for the values which are most different. Those are your anomalies, that's where you want to start looking for, for interesting things happening on the network. Just to conclude, um, part of Talos, Talos is the Threat Intelligence and Security Research branch of Cisco. In our own work, we've got five different branches. We've got Threat Intelligence, who are actively there looking for attacks and information such as this within our telemetry. The, the actual intelligence that they find, they pass on to the detection research team, who are the guys who are turning that actual intelligence into detection logic, which is then going out into the various engines that we support um, in Cisco security products. Also the software engineers who write those engines are also within uh, Talos themselves, so we control all of the bits of detection. We've also got a team who are doing vulnerability research and development looking for zero days um, in various pieces of software. If you've had a, uh, an update to your uh, Apple system over the past uh, couple of days, that was our fault. We found a whole load of zero days in Apple. We always work with the vendor in order to make sure that uh, these things get fixed and patched uh, before we talk about them. But very, very much we think part of our, our mission is to uh, make the internet a better place. And one of the best ways that we feel that we can do that is by looking for zero days and getting them patched so that we're finding the vulnerabilities before the bad guys. We also have outreach of which I'm a part. Our role is to both to go and look in the threat environment and. Uh, find the new techniques that are being used out there, but also to externalize that and do uh, talks such as this so that people understand the types of threats that are out there. <coughs> we also say we are hiring. If you're interested, come and have a chat. Um, the nature of the, of the data that we have, we've got 16 billion web requests in our telemetry that we can analyze. We get 600 billion emails coming into our Honeypot system, which we can analyze. And we also have 3.4 billion request queries which are going to our advanced malware uh, protection system where we look at an awful lot of copies of malware to analyze as well. Um, with that, I'd just like to say, please, please, please follow our research. We've got our own website. We've got a blog which you can subscribe to. You can follow our Twitter. I must also thank uh, Jason Schultz and uh, Warren Mercer who have helped enormously uh, with the work that I've uh, presented to you. And with that, I shall thank you very much and open up to questions. Please. So one of the things you didn't mention that was very sorry in my own work is so like the Uber DNS, which I know you the state of the S32. Yeah. Any things that you could you open up if you see anything? Uh yes. I found um there's a Yes, is the, is, is, is the short answer. Um, it wasn't particularly what I was looking for. I went out specifically looking for uh, pieces of malware exfiltrating data. Um, there's certainly, there's a few um, pieces of software doing um, tunneling over, over DNS. We found traces of those as well. So I was, um, I was satisfied that we'd be able to identify it if we looked at it, but it wasn't something that I was specifically looking for. 
but yes, we, we, we can find traces of it. Actually, it, it's, it's really interesting. In terms of the false positives, there was um, lots and lots of um, anomalous DNS entries that I could identify that I couldn't tie back to malware. Um, uh, a lot of people seem to be using DNS lookups to verify uh, licenses for software. So I found a whole load of uh, pieces of software that are doing license lookups by encoding that in the uh, in a DNS lookup that I, I didn't know happened, but I could uh, I could see that. There's also a whole load of other stuff that I just can't tie to anything, which as far as I see isn't probably isn't malicious. Um, but is using DNS some mechanism for transfer uh, transferring data um, or doing or getting data out from one system and into another. A um, whole load of it doesn't look suspicious, but to be honest, I have no idea what's going on. Um, so it's a matter of uh, identifying in the data the stuff which is interesting and then filtering that down to find what you can definitely identify as malicious and that which is almost certainly isn't malicious and there's still a whole load of grey stuff in the middle which uh, you can just continue monitoring. Um, I think it's probably easier if you're defending your own network because you could put in a block maybe for this and then see what stops working if you really wanted to or to try and tie it back to find what machines are making these requests. Uh, in the telemetry that we have, we don't have that. We've got a lot of amalgamated stuff, so we can only observe without necessarily understanding what is making the request. But it's still interesting. I think it's very, it's a very good exercise to go through. Please. Any any other questions? Okay, we got lunch.